that's why. Good afternoon. Um, I need to note in our final case of the day, Connect versus the Mecklenburg, Charlotte Mecklenburg Hospital Authority, uh, 
at all that Justices Irvin and Berger are recused. Uh, that being said, we will hear from the appellant. Good afternoon. Um, and may it please the court. Uh, it's great to be back with all of you, uh, except Justice Berenger. I don't think uh, uh, you were on the court when I was here last time. Um, let me start with a simple thing. Um, first, I want to make sure that I get a chance to answer every single question that you have. Uh, you know you've had a long day already. <laughs> I saw that on the schedule. Uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Sawchak and I will be able to make this interesting for you and be able to answer the questions that you have, because that's our job, and we'll do our best to do that. Uh, let me start with a couple things that I think we're let, not completely. Let me interrupt just a second. Did you want to reserve rebuttal time? Uh, yes, I'm going to try to reserve 10 minutes if I can. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Um, a couple of things that I don't think were completely clear in all the briefing, as much as there was. Um, our case, both at trial, if it had been allowed, and today, is that there was a negligent anesthesia plan and a negligent execution of the anesthesia plan. And it's really important for this discussion today to understand that those two things are inextricably intertwined. They're not separate from one another. In other words, you need to have a plan and you need to be able to execute on that plan correctly. But, but they're nonetheless two different aspects. I mean, They are absolutely two different aspects. Formulating the plans, one thing, carrying it out of something else. Yes, sir. In fact, Your Honor, I'm going to talk about those things specifically. Uh, it's a good point. So basically what happened here is that we had a two-man team. Dr. Doyle, who was the supervising physician, and uh, Mr. Van Susbergen, who was the CRNA. And what's so dramatically different about this case than Byrd, or for that matter, Daniels, either of those cases. Those cases involved bedside nurses, not in any way being demeaning, those are professionals in today's world, today's medical world. They're important and they're professionals. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a very, very different situation. Because in a minute, I'm gonna give you the exact words under oath of the two members of the team about how they perceived the collaboration and the fact that they did every single thing together, every single thing, including every aspect of the plan and every aspect of the execution of that plan. So let me, if I can, tell you exactly what the two of them said. This is Mr. Van Susbergen. So who chose this plan, this technique? Question, Mr. Van Susberg. I guess in corroboration, Dr. Doyle and myself. I don't think it was, you know, let's pick this and you know, do this. Other than we were both there. We're both anesthesia professionals. This is Mr. Van Susberg. Dr. Doyle, question, this is me talking, at trial. So, okay, so the two of you, the two of you, this is Dr. Doyle testifying, the two of you, not you by yourself, not Mr. Van Susbergen alone, the two of you developed the anesthesia plan for Amaya. Is that fair? That was the question. Answer? Yes, this is Dr. Doyle. Dr. Doyle and Van Susbergen have just under oath said exactly the same thing. The plan was developed by both of them, not by one. And then Dr. Doyle says, Mr. Van Susbergen had, you know, actually come up with this plan on his own. 
independent of Dr. Doyle. But this is, you know, you know, he was, you know, of course, planning the same thing I was planning. And I said, question, what you've just said is you had a plan, and Mr. Van Susbergen, independent of you, independent of you, Dr. Doyle, independent of you, came basically up with the same plan. Is that fair? Answer, yes. This is not an expert. <laughs> this is not a defense expert or a plaintiff's expert or somebody being paid to testify. These two men have just told you that they independently came up with the same plan and, you'll see later, executed on that same plan. The, what actually happened just so you know the, the basics. What actually happened was Mr. Van Susbergen, once they chose the anesthesia, which we're going to talk about in a minute, he had his hand on a dial because they decided to give the, ma the, the SIBO through mask, which is a gas. He had his hand on the dial. They both said there was no discussion about how much, of the, how much of the dial, but the dial went from zero to eight. Zero, nothing, obviously, eight being the most farthest they could go, the max. Dr. Mr. Van Susbergen had his hand on the dial. Mr., excuse me, Dr. Doyle controlled the mask. He was handling the mask. So one on the dial, one on the mask. Do it together. Like everything, a single thing they did through this whole thing. It's critical to understand that what happened is in a very short period of time, Mr. Van Susbergen, with no involvement of Dr. Doyle, no conversation, no nothing, on his own, went from zero to eight. Eight is the max. Eight is the max. The pharmacology Bible that's used everywhere in America is Goodman and Gilman. I'll, I can read it to you, but I'll, I'll just paraphrase it to make it shorter. What Goodman and Gilman says is that the gas that they gave to Amaya has a dose-dependent reduction in cardiac output. Now, follow me on this. In other words, it's gonna, you're gonna, whatever the cardiac output is for that particular patient, and in Maya's case, it was dangerously low, 15 to 20 percent. Yours, I hope, is somewhere between 60 and 65. I know that mine is because it was checked recently. She was 15 to 20 percent. What they gave her was going to reduce her cardiac output. And how much it reduced it was dependent on the dose. How much did they give? The more they gave, the more loss of cardiac output. So what actually happened, and that, that's, that's what they gave, the SIBO. What Goodman and Gilman, the pharmacology textbook, also says is that IV, like you can give it by mask, you can give it by IV, the anesthesia. And by the way, if you look at the records, the only thing the records say is that she was supposed to be under general anesthesia. No specific drug, no discussion, no nothing. All it says is general anesthesia. Gus, Mr. Van Susbergen, and Dr. Doyle agreed together that she would get SIBO. And we knew from the textbook that you have a very low cardiac output that is going to get reduced. And the more you give, the more the reduction. So they give her the SIBO. So what's happening in real time, if you're there, by the way, it's like a, this place is, you should see the pictures, it's like a spaceship. I mean, it's the most high-tech thing you could ever imagine. Because the kind of ablation procedure they're having to give, they have to actually map the electrical signals in the heart. And then they, what they do is once they determine where, they app, where the, the, the signals that are off are present, they cut them. 
electric, act electrically. So it's a very sophisticated procedure. So what happens here is you know in advance, both of them knew this, you know that you're going to reduce the cardiac output in a child whose cardiac out output is already very low. You know the more you give, the more loss of cardiac, cardiac output you're going to have. So not surprisingly, two minutes after the knob turns up to 8%, the max, which they can hear a heartbeat in the room. They can literally hear her heartbeat. They hear the heartbeat start dropping. Boop. It's going from boop, 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 boop. As soon as that happened, with no discussion between the two, Mr. Van Susbergen reached into his, his jacket and pulled out rescue drugs because he knew trouble, trouble, trouble. <clears throat> and he handed to Dr. Doyle, who was standing there, atropine which is a drug you give to the heart to raise the heart rate. It didn't work, is the short version. It didn't work. So Dr. Doyle, so look, if you want to talk about this two as a team, they didn't do a single thing that was that wasn't the two of them. Look at what happened when the emergency happened. They didn't even talk about it. They just did it together, tried to save her. God bless them. <laughs> you know, she's in trouble. So what happened was Dr. Doyle is giving the medicine and he's trying to get her heart going again. Because of that, they had to take the mask off and Ben Sussbergen is breathing, trying to breathe for her, basically. Both of them, the two of them, trying to resuscitate her. It didn't work. For 13 minutes, she was essentially in, in like a cardiac arrest. No oxygen to the brain, brain damage. That's what the entire case is about. Can I ask you to turn to what happened at the trial, the second trial? Yes. And in particular, it seemed that there was, um, in your opening brief, you're urging us to over, overrule Bird. But in the reply brief, there's more of a discussion um, that, that, that and, I, and I guess what I'm trying to understand is, isn't your argument here really that the trial court, in excluding the witness testimony, misapplied Bird? I mean, do we actually have to overturn it, or do we just say that um, GS 90-21.12 really applies here to a CNRA as well? CRNA, sorry. <laughs> I think, Your Honor, if you're trying to find the most conservative, most restrictive ruling, that would be appropriate in this, under the law is, would be exactly the second thing that you just described. Yeah. Uh, because if you, think, if you think about this, if this case were reversed, if we're lucky enough to get that result, then what will happen is the evidence will be permitted of what the standard of care was with the development of the plan, which he clearly was involved in all every bit of it. And that none of that was allowed because of the application of Bird. So the jury never, all this thing I just told you about Goodman and Gilman, none of that came in. It was excluded. So to answer your question, what I would see happening in a second trial, in a, I guess it would be a third trial in this case, in the third trial would be the evidence would be permitted, both sides, by the way, the, the court would not decide whether somebody's liable or not. What would be allowed is we would put on our evidence, they would put on their evidence, and the jury would be able to make the decision under the statute, the standards of practice. So that would be the more restrictive, more limited uh, change in Bird. Bird, a case which I, I don't need to spend a lot of time on. I mean, it's obvious that 90 years ago, very dramatic changes in medicine. Sweat cabinet versus I think high tech, very complex. Complex uh, uh, medical procedure that was being done. So I think the simple answer to the question is a limited change in Bird, because actually a lot of Bird makes perfect sense to me, and I'm not even sure the result is bad. By the way, for what it's worth, uh, it may be that under the circumstances the actual result was okay, 
but there was a very, uh, uh, what I say, broad statement that has been applied for a long time now to a lot of healthcare providers that had nothing to do with the kind of healthcare provider that was involved in that case. And what came in between the two, us and Byrd, is the 1975 statute, what the legislature did, not what court did, what the legislature did. And if you think about it, I think, what the legislature did, God bless them, uh, makes perfect sense. Don't you want the law to be such that if people are going to be held accountable, that the pre proper measure of accountability is done by people who actually do it, not so judges. It, I'm sorry, is it your argument that the statute, um, by passing the statute in 1975, that the General Assembly essentially um, superseded Verd? That is absolutely what we say, Your Honor, yes. So do we, do we need to, if we agree with that, address Byrd um, or just address the statute? <laughs> I've thought about this a lot, actually. Um, I think to do it correctly, there would have to be some, uh, at least, so is this the first time the Supreme Court has dealt with Byrd directly since 90 years ago? And what's happened in between is not just changes in medicine, it's the 1975 statute. So I think the appropriate thing to do under those circumstances is to put some limitations on the application of Byrd and make it absolutely clear that the 1975 statute passed by the legislature should control, i.e., we're going to allow experts who do this all the time at the appropriate time with the same training and experience, are going, that evidence will be presented, there will be factual disputes, of course, and the jury will determine what the appropriate standard is based on the evidence that's presented. And what would you contend is the appropriate role going forward of Byrd? Well, Byrd said, if I remember correctly, Byrd actually had the two common duties, common law duties, of reasonable care and diligence and best judgment. They, the court affirmed those duties, and they've been common law duties for a long time. I, they, in the pattern jury instructions, they're still in the pattern jury instructions. We have three duties. We have the statutory duty, 1975 statute, and we have the two common law duties. And that's what should apply. I said this a moment ago, but I, I'm sure I, how well, not sure how well I said it. If we try the case again, if we try the case again, the only thing that will change is the evidence that's permitted that was not permitted in the first trial. As Judge Irvin said, who's an excellent judge, by the way, uh, as he kept saying when we talked about it, I understand, but Bird is law, and I believe it's, it's uh, categorical. I have to follow it. You're going to have to deal with that in Raleigh. Well, I'm in Raleigh. <laughs> Here we are. Court of Appeals, Judge Dietz said almost exactly the same thing. The laws change, the statute exists, et cetera, but we don't have the power to do anything about this. I think if I were trying to be conservative and, and careful in uh, sculpturing uh, a ruling in this case, it would be putting some limitations on the application of Byrd and, and, uh, and applying the statute. All I want to do is to be able to put our evidence on the standard of what the standard of practice was for a CNR, CRNA under these circumstances uh, at the same time. That's all. I think that's what the statute says. Okay, can you can you, can you point me to the language of the statute that you believe is controlling? The statute, the 75 statute? Yes. The sta I can tell you, I don't have to read from it. I've, I've done this so much, Your Honor. Uh, what the statute says is, in order to, to show that there's a violation of the standard of care, we are required to present evidence of what the standard of practice was in the same or similar community for healthcare providers with the same or similar training at or about the same time. So it's, it's your view that if a physician, 
uh, anesthetist says, this is our plan that a CRNA can ignore that at any point. Can you say that one more time? I had to have trouble following it. So the physician says, this is our anesthesia plan. Right. <clears throat> the CRNA disagrees and goes in a different direction, but they have a right to do that under our statute. They do not. So their duty is to follow the plan that the doctor has presented. No, I don't, I don't agree with either one of those things. Okay. I think, okay. I think, I think what there's, no, you go, go ahead, Your Honor. No, go ahead. All I, all I was going to say, Your Honor, is I think first, the first question, right, the first duty question under the statute is what is actually the standard of practice? And well, what no, it, it, what it really is, is the why. statute, not the standard of practice. I mean, if a statute says nurse practitioners, in this case, nurse anesthetist, yes. have to follow or, or, or work under the supervision and direction of an attorney, then that's what they have to do, correct? No, sir. Uh, no, what, what <laughs> we can step back from this for just a second. Uh, what, so it, it's a question of what supervising physician means. That, by the way, that's nowhere in the statute, what you just said. What the statute says is experts in that area define what the standard of practice is. This, in this case, what the CRNA was required to do was to follow a careful, uh, reasonably diligent plan that met the three duties. That didn't happen. What also happened is the, the, in this case is the one we're talking about, Your Honor, not an abstract case. We're talking about this case, I hope. Uh, in this case, the two of them, the two of them developed a plan that was not safe, that did not meet the standard of care, and, was, and they both agreed to it. There was no, there was no dispute. If but, you're asking an abstract question unrelated to this case, I'll answer it. But that's not this case, just to be clear. But why does it matter whether they agreed or not? At the end of the day, the individual responsible for the plan was the physician. No, the reason it matters is because, Your Honor, they talk to each other. They listen to each other. But if, if, you look at the, if you actually look at the evidence in this case, what Dr. Doyle said is, I'd worked with Mr. Van Susbergen for years. I knew him well. We worked together all the time. He and other people in the baby heart team, which is what they were part of, all of us talked to each other. And I respect what they say. I listen to them. I've changed based on what they suggest. And in this case... What happened is that didn't occur. It didn't occur. That discussion never happened because both of them violated the standard of care based on our evidence, Your Honor. And so, so you, what you're asking is, does the, does the CRA still supposed to follow the standard of care? Absolutely. That's their duty. It's their legal duty, regardless of what the physician does. If, and there's, then the no physician, becomes, if there's no physician involved, can the CRNA... Uh, uh, act as an anesthesiologist? Of course not. If the CRNA cannot act independently, why can the statute not specify that the physician is responsible for the planning of the uh, anesthesia as opposed to the CRNA? Well, I didn't write the law, but that's not what it says. The statute does not require that. Well. Do you disagree that the statute talks about the limitations of what a CRNA can do? Separate from the standards of practice, 1975 statute? That's uh, what you're asking about now? Well, 90-171.20 uh, talks about that uh, a, a nurse practitioner uh, or a nurse has to work under the supervision of a licensed physician. That's just what you've agreed to. Right? There's no question about that. So the question becomes, uh, if the CRNA cannot act independently, why should the CRNA, not for the execution, but for the planning, not execution, but planning, why can the CRNA be held responsible for the planning when it's not that person's responsibility? For a variety of reasons, Your Honor. First of all, 
there's no definition of what a supervising physician means. What you find from the evidence in this case, and in all these cases, is for 90 plus percent of the time, the supervising, supervising physician is not even present when the CRNA is doing their job. They're doing their own job and they have to meet their own standard of care. That's number one. Number two, the, the delineation of privileges at this hospital said that the CRNA could choose the drugs, the, the, the anesthesia drugs, that they're responsible for being involved in the plan, that says if the CRNA tells other people in the operating room to order drugs A, B, and C, those people have to follow that order from the CRNA, not from a doctor. And it specifically says as if it came from the doctor. Your Honor, I would respectfully say that what the, the reason you do dangerous, sophisticated medical procedures in big hospitals with different levels of medical providers is so that you get the best possible care under those circumstances, the best possible safe care. And I believe to my soul that having an anesthesiologist, we're talking about anesthesia, an anesthesiologist and a CRNA talking, consulting with each other, they understand that doc the doctor is moving, Dr. Doyle was, from one room to another, covering four or five different surgeries. Mr. Van Susbergen was there the whole time. Mr. Van Susbergen. All I'm saying, Your Honor, is this is a joint responsibility. I'm not saying that Mr. Van Susbergen has to meet the doctor's standard of care. That's not true. But he does have to meet what is a high-level, sophisticated, collaborative standard of care. That is required by the law. And he was not, that the evidence that could have shown that he violated in this case did not occur. You're, you're, you're well re within your rebuttal. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you. We'll hear from the appellee. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, I'm Matt Sawcheck from Robinson, Robinson Bradshaw in Raleigh, and I represent the defendants, Mr. Van Sustbergen and the hospital authority. This case is here on a PDR about the exclusion of part of one expert witness in the second trial of this case. The plaintiffs are here asking that multi-week trials the court, the, excuse me, the plaintiffs are asking that a third trial be had. And in that vehicle, they're asking this court to change 90 years of North Carolina tort law on the duties of medical professionals, and specifically to hold nurses liable for decisions made by physicians, as the Chief Justice's questions reveal. Now that's a proposed change that clashes with 90 years of case law from this court and from the Court of Appeals. Not just Byrd, but Blanton and the Paris and uh, Daniels decisions from the Court of Appeals and yet others. And those define and limit the tort duties of nurses like Mr. Van Susbergen. Specifically, they give them only a limited duty to avoid participating in obvious negligence. And the basis for that rule is so important. It is that under the statute cited by the Chief Justice and others, 90, um, 171.27e, 9018a, 91.15b and c, physicians have the sole ultimate decision-making authority um, and they are the ones responsible. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Dr. Doyle was the ultimate decision maker in Amaya Gillette's care. The plaintiffs have already settled with Dr. Doyle. Um, he was the professional responsible, but now the plaintiffs want to recover from Mr. Von Sussbergen as well, but that 
desire, understandable one as it is for a second recovery, doesn't justify creating a whole new form of tort liability for nurses. Can I just um, explore that a little bit? Because um, as you were talking about the statutes that we need to look at, you didn't mention 90-21.12, which is, I think, the statute we've been talking about that sets out the um, standard of care that, or how, how it's to be defined in a medical malpractice action. And that statute doesn't exempt CRNAs. It doesn't, it says healthcare professionals. And, and so if, if this is, um, if this statute also is one that we're supposed to apply, why wouldn't this also apply to your client? For this reason, Your Honor, this court itself has held in Wall versus Stout that 90, 2112 does not displace this court's teachings on the tort duties of people. And the second reason is 9021.12 is about the second element of negligence, namely <coughs> breach of duty. But the bird line of cases is about the first element of negligence, namely the existence of a duty. The very first line of the opinion section of the Byrd opinion is, what duty does a nurse owe to a patient? And that's the key for this case. This case rests on a duty limitation, but the plaintiffs are skipping ahead to the second element and talking about breach of a duty that the Byrd line of cases uh, says is non-existent or limited in a way that is fatal to the expert opinion in question. You, you had a question, Your Honor? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, so, so, yeah, so I am trying to understand. Are you then saying that this um, C CRNA did not have a duty of care to this patient? He had a limited duty of care. He had a duty to perform accurately according to the physician's instructions, and that was the subject of the second trial, was whether there was negligent administration of the anesthesia, he had a duty not to act spontaneously on his own accord. Um, he had a duty to not deviate from the physician's instructions. All of these points are in bird. But, but didn't he also have a duty to, to um, abide by the standard of care that was in um, the, the same or similar communities under the same and similar circumstances? I mean, doesn't he also have to abide by that requirement? The Byrd line of cases would say, this is not a subject for definition by expert testimony, but it is a subject for definition by legislative health care policy, namely the statutes that define the respective roles of physicians and nurses. The Chief Justice cited section 90, um, uh, 171.27e, and that makes clear that the duties of a nurse are primarily to act as an aid to um, physicians. And that's the problem with the expert testimony in question that I think obviously um, my colleagues want to make expert testimony the focus and they want to use 90.21.12 as their vehicle. But as I've said, 90.21.12 is speaking to the wrong element. There is a duty limitation and it's, it's coming from these considerations of you know, partly respect for the legislative separation of role between physicians and nurses. So is it your position that a nurse or a CRNA in this case does not have, um, is, isn't answerable for um, meeting the standard of care for its own profession? This court, I would say to your question, Justice Hudson, that this court has fixed the standard of care in a way that supersedes the statute. That again, we're talking about the duty element and Byrd has specified, the Byrd line of cases has specified the duty out of respect for the statutory distinction between um, doctors and nurses. So what effect, if any then, did the statute have on the Byrd line of cases as you call them? The, uh, in a situation where the plaintiff's theory of the case is consistent with the bird defined duties, then we're on to the statute of care. And indeed- Which means what? 
Well, for example, at the trial of this case, Mr. Uh, Van Susbergen was tried on whether he negligently administered the sevoflurane. There was extensive expert testimony in the vehicle of 902112 because that was a duty that was permissible under the bird line of cases. So why wouldn't it be an evidentiary matter as to what is um, within, what are the duties of these categories that are defined, that are set forth in the statute? Because this court um, and the Court of Appeals have defined the duty. Duty is primarily a question of law for the court and not a matter for expert definition. This court's 1955 decision in Pinnix says that. The Court of Appeals decision in Mazingo says that. That's also said in the restatement that duty is a um, first line definition of tort liability and it's usually defined by external factors such as here the statutes that say what a nurse must do, can do, and the like. If I may, I'd like to turn attention to another troubling feature, which is the standard uh, that, Your Honor, question? Yeah, before you leave that, um, the language in 90-21.12 that talks about um, that the healthcare provider shall not be liable unless a trier of fact finds by the greater weight of evidence that the care was not in accordance with the standards of practice among members of the same healthcare um, profession with similar training and experience and makes it cer certainly sound like that is a matter of evidentiary um, showing. That's right, but we get to 90.21.12 on the second element of negligence, whether there's been a breach of the duty of care um, Your Honor, I think we might all agree that there is not a universal duty of care to conform to 90-21-12. I'm not a health care provider. I have no duty to conform to 90-21-12. That tells us logically that we've got to get into 90-21-12 before we apply 90-21-12. This case never got that far as to selection of anesthesia. Because remember, that's what we're talking about here. Mr. Van Susbergen has already been tried and has had a defense verdict, a defense verdict on negligent administration of anesthesia. He had that duty. He went to trial on that and won. What plaintiffs want to do is to give him a duty that he does not have, namely a duty to choose the anesthesia in contravention of what Dr. Doyle, the responsible physician, wanted to do. That was not his duty. This court has decided in Byrd and the like. And the plaintiffs, of course, are- Well, if there is evidence that um, members of the profession um, have that duty in a similar or same type of role in other hospitals or in, in, in the locality at, involved here, why isn't that a matter that could be shown by evidence? It seem, it, are, are you saying it's a matter of law? I am saying it's a matter of law, Your Honor, and this court has pointed that same point out in the Pinnock's case, and there are other authorities. It's in the restatement. Um, the first, you know, we're all familiar, of course, that the first element of um, negligence recovery is the existence of a duty, and as this court has taught in, in Byrd and in, in Blanton and other decisions, that is uh, a point that this court carefully defines. And in this element, where we're talking about the physician-nurse relationship, it needs to be defined with reference to statutes. And the General Assembly has been um, very, very deliberate in deciding when nurses operate under physician supervision. There have been many stat, Your Honor. Well, well can't, the, can't the parameters of the duty be explained and um, described with reference to evidence? If I mean, the, I don't, I'm not sure how you would do it otherwise. Your Honor, the, uh, this court's decision in Byrd illustrates how it can be done, that the court has examined these issues of law and, you know, to some extent, health care policy, and has decided it protects patients for physicians to be in charge. The last thing we want to have, I hope we would, did you have a question, Your Honor? Well, no, I just was wondering what, what effect, if any, 
um, the passage of these statutes in 1975 and forward um, has on, on the line of cases that's 90 years old. This court's decision in Blanton, which is 12 years after 1975, would show that there is no effect. The um, obvious negligence standard, which is the standard governing this aspect of Mr. Van Susbergen's activities, was applied by this court itself in Blanton. Also, the Court of Appeals decisions in Paris and Daniels likewise follow this court's teachings in Byrd years after the enactment of 90-21-12. The one thing out further I'd say about 90-21-12 is it illustrates a point of agreement between my friend and myself, which is fundamentally, these are issues for the legislature. That what's being requested of you, Your Honor, is all of you, is to overrule pre-existing case law on these tort duties. Um, and there needs to be, of course, a strong showing that, that that's uh, justified. And that brings us really to how similar this case is to the parks situation just last year from this court where if you look at uh, the considerations briefed by the defendants in parks where there was a request similar to today to overrule previous case law, all of those same factors are present. The new rule being sought by my colleagues is inconsistent with the common law, inconsistent with the statutes on the division of labor between physicians and nurses, and poses serious questions of healthcare policy and line drawing. And what is this court being asked, finally, to replace it with? That's where things become super, really troubling, because the plaintiffs would base liability for nurses like Mr. Van Susbergen on a notion of collaboration, that they can be held liable whenever they have collaborated, that's the word used, with a physician and the result is, is an adverse one. But that's the precedent you're being asked to set, is that collaboration can be a source of tort liability. That is too vague a term to become a standard, a duty for tort liability. Um, one illustration of that comes from the North Carolina Medical Society case from uh, 2005 from the Court of Appeals, 169 NC App 1. There, there was debate between the medical board and the nursing board about what collaboration means in the context of CRNAs, this very topic. They litigated, they settled, and 12 years later, they were still debating and litigating over what collaboration means. That is the test that you're being asked to inscribe into the North Carolina reports as the standard to fuel tomorrow's medical malpractice cases. And this case illustrates the problem even more. Because here, what my call I'm sorry, question you're Sorry on? to interrupt you, but Go ahead. I'm just trying to understand because as, as I understand what the plaintiffs were saying, um, they just want to apply 90-21.12 to this professional in this case. And, and so, I, it, I don't. I don't understand how that is creating a new cause of action. We're ju they're just saying our ex experts should be allowed to testify as to what the standard of care for a healthcare professional, such as a CRNA, is, and, and whether or not. The, and then you know the question of whether or not it was met here. But th they're not asking to uh, write any laws. <laughs> they're asking us to apply this law. Your Honor, there are two problems with what they're asking for. One I've already mentioned, which is the distinction between duty and breach of duty, with 90-21-12 being on the second of those. But secondly is, essentially, we've got a pre-existing line of case law stemming forward from Byrd that establishes limits on the duty and gives duties. And the proposition from my colleagues is that 90-21-12 wipes all that out. This court ruled directly to the opposite effect in Wall versus Stout. The plaintiffs in that case sought a jury instruction 
that the only thing to be said in the instructions was the substance of 90.21.12. This court rejected that and found it unjustified and said under no circumstances was 90.21.12 intended to wipe out earlier case law. And in fact, as this court has instructed in Black versus Little John, 90.21.12 is a tort reform statute. It is meant to limit medical malpractice liability to respond to rising medical malpractice premiums. That's not me saying that. That's this court saying that in 1983 in Black versus Little John. This is the very wording of 90.21.12 is liability limiting. There shall be no liability for damages unless. So that's the point, is one, the duty breach distinction, and two, is the role and intent of the legislature in 90.21.12. It is not an overruling of case law. It is an adaptation and really a codification, as this court said in Wall, of case law on a relatively narrow question of who is a proper expert on this breach of duty question. So, so help me if I'm misunderstanding. It seems like to me the question is, does the CRNA have some independent duty of, of um, uh, assessing a patient and, and coming up with a treatment plan? Uh, or is the CRNA's duty uh, to uh, carry out the plan that's developed by the anesthetist? Is that a fair I might phrase it just only slightly differently, Your Honor, which is regardless of what might be said by the CRNA or between him and the physician, ultimately, when the decision is made by the physician, it is binding. And that this court, I don't think, would want to enunciate a standard that would depend on the specific communication pattern and exactly what was said in what order, at least under the facts of a case like this, where there is no doubt whatsoever, Dr. Doyle was in the room the whole time. Dr. Doyle said, it was my responsibility, it was my plan. He discussed the plan with the family to use sevoflurane. Um, there's no question, he was in charge, he made the decision in question. And that is, brings us right back to Bird. And so, in this case, um, the CRNA has already, uh, uh, the, the actions of the CRNA have already been subject to a jury trial and the jury, with regard to the execution of the plan. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, jury, jury's already found that. And the only aspect that was not submitted to the jury, or if you will, the, the evidence was excluded, had to do with the role the CRNA uh, may have had in um, coming up with this plan as opposed to that being the primary responsibility of the anesthesiologist. That's correct. Yes, specifically that uh, the plaintiffs wanted to hold Mr. Van Susbergen liable um, as if he were the decision maker on this plan when by law, by statute, 917120, 9018 and the others, he was not the decision maker. And that is exactly the thrust of the bird line of decisions, is we don't want to treat in negligence law non-decision makers as if they were decision makers. We don't want to judge nurses by the duties of physicians. But don't we want to hold them accountable for the duties to which their profession expects to be held? They are indeed held liable uh, to duties, but those duties have been defined by this court. And I think that may be where, um, where the disconnect is occurring, is where the professional standards, and I think Your Honor is referring to, come in, is not on the definition of duty, which again, I emphasize, by this court's own decision in Pinnix and by other authorities, is a question of law, the first element, where the, prof the expert testimony and the like come in is on the second element, breach of duty, and, and that's where 92112 might come into play here it did not come into play because the slice of proposed testimony from the one witness, Mr. Carey, um, 
was in conflict directly with this court's teachings. And so does it boil down to that the CR, the, the question is, does the CRNA have an independent duty to, in this case, the plaintiff, to um, uh, come up with a, an anest, uh, anesthesia plan? That is, is certainly one of the questions here, and the answer is no. That the physician is, by statute, um, in charge of the anesthesia plan. And essentially what my colleagues are striving to do is to deconstruct the communications between Mr. Van Sustbergen and the real decision maker here, Dr. Doyle, and to get this court and later courts in the role of deciding at what point in that cloud of communications has collaboration occurred and to meet out liability based on that standard. The point I would like to share with the court today is that is an incoherent standard. Collaboration is no basis for deciding liability or not, especially in very tragic and serious cases like this. Consider, first of all, the outcome in the North Carolina Medical Society case, as I've mentioned, Consider also exactly what the plaintiffs are saying, and my colleague, Mr. Edwards, has already mentioned it. Consider what they are saying amounts to collaboration here. The key pages of testimony, or some of them, are volume 29 of the transcript, pages 237 and 238. And in the moment of truth, at that point in the transcript, Dr. Doyle says, he was thinking the same thing I was at the same time. That is what the plaintiffs are saying is collaboration. Mere parallel thinking between the nurse and the physician. Or silently, they either had a brief conversation while literally rolling into the catheterization lab, excuse me, or literally nothing was said and Dr. Doyle inferred, do you really want future courts to be deciding whether those snippets or not of interaction between a doctor and a nurse are, um, are going to be seen as collaboration and therefore seen as the breach of a duty. Because that is exactly the standard being proposed to you to replace 90 years of case law. And I'd say, fundamentally, the Parks decision from this court shows the proper course. This is a situation where a proposal is being made to make fundamental changes in tort law, to throw aside the common law, to put North Carolina at variance from other states. Plaintiffs had cited not one decision from anywhere that adopts a collaboration standard. So if, if we talk about collaboration standard, I see some law clerks in the back. Isn't it better, for example, for the courts, for justice to collaborate with our law clerks, and yet at the end of the day, we make decisions? Isn't that the same type of relationship between an anesthesiologist and a nurse anesthetist who we want to be part of the discussion, but at the end of the day, the doctor makes the decision? Mr. Chief Justice, you apparently have been reading my notes. I have that same example in my notes after consultation with my colleagues, exactly. That the proposition is to hold responsible the law clerks who are licensed North Carolina lawyers for decisions made by your honors. Let me offer other examples. Imagine that a paralegal is working with me on a motion to dismiss and he omits a viable personal jurisdiction defense. I lightly review the draft, file it as is, and waive the defense. Under plaintiff's theory of the case, the paralegal has collaborated with me, and therefore he's liable for my professional malpractice in waiving the client's um, personal jurisdiction defense. The, the examples are legion of non-decision makers interacting with decision makers but the ultimate tort liability lies with the decision maker herself. That's the wisdom of this court's teachings um, in Bird. So, your honors, in closing, I would say 
Fundamentally, we're in agreement with the plaintiffs. I was pleased to see on pages 11, 26, 28 of the reply brief, this is fundamentally an issue for the General Assembly. But the General Assembly has not answered the issue in 90-21-12 for the reasons this court said in Wall. And in the end, what's being promoted to this court as a new standard is unworkable this collaboration standard as illustrated so well by the Chief Justice's example and, and by others. That is no way to lay aside 90 uh, years of case law. So we'd ask the court to follow the path taken in parks and to realize that this is a core, uh, situation um, well suited for resolution by the legislature. It has been resolved in part already by the legislature in these scope of practice statutes. And maybe to ask the question, is this record with such a narrow slice of expert testimony really a fit subject for discretionary review at all when such a sweeping result is being sought on such a narrow slice and such a large and murky record? Thank you, Your Honors, for hearing us today. Thank you, Counsel. Rebuttal. So I can't begin to tell you how much I disagree with what I just heard. The legislature has, has in 1975, established what's supposed to happen. Experts testify about what the standard of care is. What Justice Hudson had talked about over and over and over, never got an answer to, is a factual question. That's why we have trials. The trials are about what the standard of care is. What do you there. say about the argument that, it, that the duty is a matter of law? That's the, the duty. The, I can tell you exactly what the duties are. Meet the standards of practice, reasonable care and diligence, best judgment. Those are the duties. Th this is about the duties? The duties have been established for years now, decades. We, I've tried dozens of these cases. We use the pattern jury instructions. This is an, I'm sorry, I'm a great lawyer, but this is absurd on its face. It just is. The duties are very well established. What happens in the trial, you have an empty vessel, which are the duties, that are filled by the evidence in the trial. <laughs> That's what trials are. It's the reason we have to trial these cases. This is a ridiculous argument. This is, this is what happens. If, I want you to just hear just a couple of things, if you stay with me. This is the, this is the actual law that controls specifically nurse anesthesia practice. North Carolina Administrative Code 21 NCAC 36.0226. First, the individual nurse anesthetist maintains accountable for all of their own actions. And now listen to this. These activities that they're responsible for include selecting, implementing, and managing general anesthesia and developing uh, anesthesia plans. That's what this trial was about. This is law. This is law that was enabled by the legislature. I mean, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And then you, then you look at what the hospital itself said. In the hospital that Dr. Mr. Van Susbergen practiced in, their own hospital privileges say, that he is responsible for and has privileges for developing and implementing an anesthesia plan for selecting, obtaining, or administering the anesthesia drugs. What they're arguing is because of a 90-year-old case, this is what's happening, and because of a 90-year-old case as a matter of law, you cannot pay attention to what's actually happening in cath labs in 2010. That's exactly what this argument is. That's what trials are for. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to everyone. Madam Clerk.